anxiety incubator. You've all been there. You just don't recognize the term maybe, right? A situation where you were in it and about the only thing you could choose to do was worry, be apprehensive, right? An anxiety incubator. How many of y'all ever been in the lobby of an ER or sat in an ER room? I, I sat in one yesterday uh, with one of my daughters. And how many been in the, in the hospital waiting room? You know, as a pastor, I've sat in my probably more than my fair share uh, of anxiety incubators when it comes to ER uh, emergency room visits or uh, hospital waiting rooms uh, with, with families, obviously church families, but also with my own family. Like I said, I sat there yesterday uh, at the Belpre ER uh, with my daughter Lily and uh, Emily, and, and Lily is fine. Uh, she had a terrible sinus infection, which led to some terrible headaches, which they had to get to the bottom of, but... In all of that, I remembered how we as humans, even we as Christians, in our frailties, we never truly can completely get rid of the emotion that comes called anxiety, right? We believe in the sovereignty of God. We really do, that He's in absolute control. Uh, We believe that He's gracious. We believe that He's merciful. We believe that He has healing power, but we just really struggle with that emotion called anxiety. Worry, apprehension. And it's exactly, it goes against exactly what Scripture tells us we're to have. Um, If we go according to Scripture, what are we supposed to have? What is the exact opposite of anxiety? What? You you don't have it much, right? (laughs) What what is it? Faith, yes, but what's the opposite of peace? I mean, (laughs) I just told you. The opposite of anxiety is peace. There you go. Peace, right? We're supposed to have peace. In this time of Christmas, we really think about, we should be thinking about peace. But as I thought about Christmas, and I went back to the very first Christmas story with peace on the brain, with peace in my mind, I began to think about the actual characters of the very first Christmas story. And I couldn't help but think about that poor carpenter from Nazareth. And no, I'm not talking about Jesus. He wasn't born yet. I'm talking about Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. Right? If there was ever a person who had an experience in what could be called that anxiety incubator, it was definitely him. I mean, you think about all that was going on in his life, and you would think that peace was the last thing that he was experiencing. I mean, my goodness, his fiancée, Mary, had become pregnant, and and Joseph knew that it wasn't his. He was from a small town of Nazareth where a lot of people were probably looking down their self-righteous noses at him and at Mary. A lot of people probably wondering, what are you going to do? You're an absolute fool. What is going on? On top of all that, guess what Caesar wanted? More taxes. And so guess what that meant? That Joseph, who was going to take his wife, who was pregnant, and they were going to take a three-day journey to his hometown of Bethlehem, where he could get registered for the census that the Caesar has demanded. What are you trying to say, Pastor? Joseph's life was in turmoil. Joseph's life was chaotic. Joseph's life was a mess. What would he do? How would he handle it? Well, we're going to find out today. Take your Bibles and open up to the first gospel. The gospel of Matthew. C-3PO wants you to turn to the gospel of Matthew too. Turn to the gospel of Matthew. And we're going to be looking at the verses 18 through 25. And as we do this, you're going to learn... What Joseph did in this chaotic situation. And not only are you going to learn what Joseph did in this chaotic situation, which is experiencing God's peace, you're also going to learn how you, how I, even in a chaotic situation, can experience God's peace. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Follow along with me as I read. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, 
Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, it's very interesting as you read the Christmas story, there's something that you don't see whatsoever in regards to the life of Joseph. You don't see a hint of stress at all. Oh, I am absolutely sure it was certainly there, but it was not what stood out to men. The men who wrote these accounts, it's not what stood out to them about this man. In fact, it wasn't just Matthew. None of the biblical authors record anything about Joseph being worried or apprehensive or having anxiety. In fact, they don't say anything even close. He's portrayed as a righteous man. He's portrayed as a fitting husband for this young woman, Mary. He's portrayed as a, a father, right? The earthly father. God selected Joseph to be the earthly father of Jesus, the Messiah. Folks, listen to me. Joseph's life was in a chaotic mess. His world was spinning out of control. And yet Joseph had peace. Let me say it a different way. The only reason Joseph had peace was because Joseph experienced God's peace. In fact, when you look at Matthew chapter 1, that's exactly what it gives us, a glimpse of the peace of God, even in the midst of chaos. And if I had to end my sermon right now, which I'm not going to do, but if I had to end it right now, I would end it with this statement. You want to know why Joseph truly experienced God's peace? Because Joseph was willing to do it God's way. Joseph handled the situation in God's way. Now, as we examine the pattern of Joseph's life, especially related to the birth of Christ, we cannot miss a very important reality that was true of Joseph, and it can be true of us if we want it to be. If you don't take anything else from the sermon, take this. If you don't write anything else down, I ask you to write this down because it's important. You ready? We experience God's peace in the midst of chaos when our attitudes and actions display a willingness to honor God despite whatever difficult situation we may be in at that present moment. Say it again. You want God's peace in the midst of chaos? Then your attitude and your actions have to display a willingness to honor God despite whatever it is that you're going through right now. In this passage today, we're going to see three areas that we can honor God in. We're going to see three what I call peace producers. Three things that can facilitate us experiencing the peace of God in our lives. And we're going to take a look at each. But before we do, I think it's critical that we understand what we're aiming for, what we're shooting for. Because we're not talking about the world's definition of peace. I'm not talking about your definition of peace. I'm talking about God's definition of peace. So we need to understand what that is. So let me tell you. Let me define it. The true peace that we are looking for is not the absence of chaos. So if you're looking for the absence of chaos, you're not looking for the peace of God. Because true peace is not the absence of chaos. It's the inner calm that we can have in the midst of it. Period. Let me say it a different way. Peace, God's peace, has nothing to do with external situations and everything to do with the internal condition of our heart. One more way of saying this. Peace is not the absence of storms. Peace is not the absence of crashing waves. Peace is the calm. Listen, Christian. Peace is the calm that comes when we remember and realize that Jesus is in the boat with us. That's peace. That's peace. 
You say, Pastor, I want some of that. How do I get that? Even in chaotic situations, what produces that type of peace? Genuine peace. Number one, compassion. Compassion produces peace. This passage makes it clear that Joseph was faced with a very difficult decision. What was he going to do in the situation he was in? What was he going to do with Mary? This was his fiance, right? And she was pregnant out of wedlock. There were many consequences that she could face, including death. And Joseph held those in his hand. It was his call. Joseph could have responded out of anger, but he didn't. You want to know what Joseph's response was? Even his initial response was one of compassion. Now let me make sure you understand a little bit about what that word means as I read the story. Betrothed, right? Mary and Joseph were in a betrothal, right? We don't use that word in our culture anymore. It's a promise to be married. Now, we try to compare it to our modern word of engagement, but we really can't. If you took our word engagement and injected about 10 syringes of steroids into it, then maybe, maybe we could do it. You see, when you got betrothed in those times, you were married. The only two things that were yet to be culminated was you moved in together and physical intimacy. Other than that, you were married were married your living quarters and intimacy were the only things that were to come how did this happen well back in those days Nora, you'll be glad to know this moms and dads arranged the marriages right they arranged them mary's family got together joseph's family got together and they decided that joseph and mary were going to get married they were betrothed Right after they did this, then there was a formal ceremony where this betrothal was made known. And at that moment, other than living quarters and intimacy, they were married. And then third, after a certain amount of time, the couple was actually then married, moved in together, and fully were a married couple. That's how it happened. That's the situation that Mary and Joseph were in. They were betrothed. Now add what was apparent, at least, to the eye, and that was that Mary had been unfaithful. That's what everybody thought. That's what everybody saw, and you really can't blame them. I mean, she's pregnant. And there were two things that came with this. A very, very, very negative and severe social stigma. But then some severe consequences. You need to understand that according to the Jewish civil law based upon Scripture, Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24, if you want to reference it, Joseph had the right to divorce her. And then upon his call, the Jewish authorities had the right, if they determined to do it, to stone Mary to death. Listen to what the scripture says. I'm reading from the Living Bible because it's an easy translation. If a girl who is engaged, this is Deuteronomy 22. If a girl who is engaged is seduced within the walls of a city, both she and the man who seduced her shall be taken outside the gates and stoned to death. The girl because she didn't scream for help and the man because he has violated the purity of another man's fiance. What Mary had apparently done was serious and it had serious consequences and all Joseph had to do was pull the trigger but here is where the story really gets fascinating Joseph made a choice to be compassionate Joseph had compassion when based upon what was evidenced by just looking at the situation Joseph had every right to be angry Anger's not sin. You know that, right? If it was, the Bible wouldn't say be angry and sin not. There is time when anger is appropriate. There's anger that is righteous. Think about when Jesus overturned the money changer's table, right? In the temple. Think about when Jesus rebuked the disciples for trying to shoo away all the children. Jesus had a right to be angry then because his anger was righteous. Joseph had a right to be angry in this situation because his anger was righteous. But you want to know what Joseph did instead? He chose to be compassionate. 
And it's in situations like these. This is a wonderful illustration of when I believe we can incredibly display the glory of God. When we can incredibly display godly character. Because here's the deal, right? Having compassion on someone who we feel sorry for, well, that's one thing. But having compassion upon someone who has done us wrong and we know that we can be rightfully and righteously angry at them, to still have compassion on somebody like that, that's a a horse of a different color. And here's what I believe. I believe that extending compassion, even when we have the right to be angry, it's one of the closest things to expressing Christ-like character. Because what did he do on the cross? As he looked out over a crowd of people, the majority whom of which had contributed to him hanging there. Folks who had nailed him here. Folks who had beat him. The soldiers who were gambling over his clothes. The self-righteous religious leaders of the day who were sitting back there just saying, hey, come on down. He had every right to be angry. He had every right to call legions of angels from heaven and say, get me out of here and take care of this. And they would have. And yet, what did Jesus do? With utter compassion, he looked out and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. When Jesus Jesus could have responded in anger, he gave compassion. Jesus gave the gift of compassion. Joseph gave the gift of compassion. Here's my question for you this morning, church. Will you give the gift of compassion? You want peace? Give the gift of compassion. Now, be careful. Don't answer too quickly. I, I, oh, yes, yes, I'll give it. That, that's what I do sometimes when I, when I get this spiritual type question. Sure, I will. But I think we have to be careful before we make the commitment to give compassion. We have to consider the cost. The Bible makes it clear about considering the cost of things. You must consider the cost for the gift of compassion. The gift of compassion cost Joseph something. The gift of compassion cost Jesus something. The gift of compassion is going to cost us. In fact, it is something that is more valuable than money. You want to know what the gift of compassion will cost us? Time. Time. And folks, time is more valuable, more valuable than money. I, I can make more money, right? But I can't buy more time. I can't buy back the time that I've used. Can I tell you what I believe the number one, number one cause that keeps us as Christians from extending compassion to others? And it is our busyness. Busyness. I'm not going to speak for you, but I'm going to speak for me. I'll let God speak to you. When I get too busy, I don't have time to extend compassion. I mean, we're in the busiest season of the year, right? As I look out at you guys, many of you are sitting there going, how in the world am I going to get done all that I need to get done in the next three weeks? But let's be honest with each other. Let's not blame busyness on Christmas or on any season. Folks, in the culture that we live in, especially in the United States of America, busyness is the norm. It is our culture. And I am convinced, I am very convinced that the reason we as Christians, we as a church, often have so little effect on people around us is because, or I should say it's not because, we don't care. It's simply because we're either too busy to notice the needs of others, or we see them, We just don't have time to do anything about it. Now you need to know something. This goes against scripture. It goes against what the word of God tells us to do. In fact, I'm speaking specifically of Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 which says this. Because of God's deep love and concern for you, you should practice tender hearted mercy and kindness to others. Now notice what it said. You should practice compassion it doesn't say you should talk about it it doesn't say you should intend to do it it doesn't say you should make plans to do it it says to do it folks compassion is action compassion is love in action but here's the thing here it is 
Compassion is something you do. The problem is for us to do anything, we have to sacrifice something else. There's very little time when you can do more than one thing at once. And the problem with us is, are we willing to sacrifice in our overcommitted and extended lives that we seem to be racing through all the time? Will we take time to stop and sacrifice the time that we were going to do something, usually for ourselves or whatever, and will we choose to use that time to have compassion for someone else? That's what Joseph did. You see, Joseph could have choose, chosen self. Joseph could have gotten wrapped up in what had happened to him and what he needed to do to take care of him. And he could have rightly chosen to be angry, right? His fiancée was pregnant and they were betrothed. His world, because of her actions, had been thrown into chaos. But Joseph wanted peace. I've told you that compassion will produce Peace. So here's what Joseph did. He did not enter into a chaotic situation and seek for peace by looking for what he wanted. He went into the chaotic situation and experienced God's peace because he was willing to have compassion on others. He was willing to think about others. He was willing to think about Mary. That's how we find peace, folks. That's how we experience God's peace. We get our focus off of us and our chaotic situation, and we get our focus on others. Now listen to me, church. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about today, but as I prepared this message and went over it many, many times this week, the Holy Spirit made it very, 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 very clear to me. Rob Vernon, Rob Vernon, you want to reduce anxiety in your own life. you got a lot of worries in your life, Rob. got a lot of anxiety in your life, Rob. You want to you wanna have some peace in that? You want to deal with it? Then get your focus off of you. Quit being so absorbed with the chaos in your life. Start focusing on compassion. Start focusing on other people's lives and the needs around you instead of worrying about your own needs. And I believe if we were honest Christians, we could all say, yeah. Yeah, I need to do a little more of that myself. Folks, compassion can often do what prescriptions can't. It can lessen the anxiety related to your life. And you want to know how you do it? You get your focus off of you and you get it on the needs of others. Compassion produces peace. As we look at our passage today, we also see number two, prayer produces peace. Talking to God, allowing God to talk to us, gives us peace, produces peace. Joseph had a dream, and in the dream, God tells him what's going on. I I don't know. God has the power to speak through dreams, of course, but that's not how he does it all the time. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through prayer. But here's here's what I do know. We want peace, then we need to give God a chance to weigh in on difficult decisions. You're in the chaos right now of knowing you've got to make some type of difficult decision. Guess what? You want peace? Let God weigh in. How do you let God weigh in? Talk to God. Pray. You turn your decision over to God and you let him have a say about what you're going to do. And even in the most chaotic circumstances, peace can be there. You want to know why? It's because of what prayer really is. Let me tell you what that is. Prayer is making real. The condition of a surrendered heart where we place everything, including the chaos, including the worries, including the anxiety. We place all of it at the feet of our Father, at the feet of our Lord, at the feet of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, at the feet of the God who spoke the universe into existence. We lay all of it at His feet and we are confessing with our mouth and evidencing with our actions that we believe He's merciful and loving and in complete control of everything. That's what prayer is. And the most important aspect of prayer is not bowing your heads. It's bowing your heart. It's bowing your heart and your life in a token of surrender and saying, Father, here it is. Here's this mess. Not my will, but yours be done. And again, whose example are we following? Yes, Joseph's, but more importantly, Jesus. 
pastor friend of mine pointed me to a really neat uh, article about some research that was done back in 2010. Now, it's a very fascinating article, not just because of what was discovered, but really because of who was trying to do the discovery. This was not a bunch of research done by a bunch of theologians. It was actually done by a bunch of non-Christian researchers. And it's about prayer. Listen as I read it. It's clear that stressful situations can bring out the religious in anyone. What's not clear is whether turning to religion actually helps to relieve anxiety. Even less well understood is which, if any, of the aspects of religion are effective. Does the social support that comes with attending religious meetings such as church, does that help? Or some other religious activity? Or is it some facet of belief itself? Terrence Hill at the University of Miami and his colleagues have looked at this using data from the U.S. General Social Survey. Basically, they were looking to see what aspects of religion correlated with anxiety. Now, unfortunately, they don't tell us whether religious people are more or less anxious than the general population. But what they do tell us is this. They found that the church attendance was linked. This is church attendance. Was linked to a very small reduction in anxiety. Next, belief in the afterlife was linked to a somewhat larger reduction than church attendance. But as they dug a bit further, they found that prayer had different effects in different people. In people who have poor health or whose finances have recently worsened, prayer significantly decreased anxiety. Remarkably, however, belief in the afterlife did not reduce anxiety more in people whose health was poor. In other words... And here's the key phrase. Prayer trumped church attendance and even belief in the afterlife for noticeably reducing anxiety. You mean to sum that article up in one statement? It's this. Prayer produces peace. Prayer produces peace. Because as we pray in these chaotic situations like Joseph was in, we are saying this to God. God, I don't got this. You say, what is this? You define it. There's probably a lot of thises out here this morning. Your this is your area of chaos that you're in right now. This is that situation that is bringing you anxiety right now. And you come in prayer and you say, God, I ain't got this. I've tried this before and I have messed it up. I have failed on my own and all it has done is produce more fear and more anxiety. God, which is the very opposite of what you want me to have because you want me to experience peace through you. So, Father, in prayer, I'm coming to you now and I'm placing this again, whatever this is. I'm placing it in your hands, the hands that are all powerful right? The God who is present everywhere, the God who is in complete control, I am placing it in your hands. And as you do that, here's what you're saying, whatever you choose to do, I'm okay with it. And you want to know why we're okay with it? Because when we truly surrender, when we truly want that peace, a key to our prayers is this, my heavenly Father always has my good in mind. It's always about His greatest glory and my greatest good. Folks, that's how prayer produces peace. Joseph had peace because he was compassionate. Joseph had peace because he talked to God. But number three, you got to be obedient. Obedience produces peace. Joseph had godly motives, meaning he had compassion. Joseph let God weigh in on the decision, meaning he had communication with God through prayer. But here's the danger. Joseph could have stopped right there. And you can do the same. See, the danger is this. The danger is in us hearing what God wants us to do, but doing something different. Joseph didn't do that, though. In fact, you look at Scripture, and it tells us Joseph did what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. Joseph obeyed God. Hear me, church. If you came in here today looking for something, and today you realize it's the peace of God that you're looking for, then the only way to experience that, even during your most chaotic situation, is to do things His way. Obey. 
You want to know where the safest place to be is? At the center of God's will. You want to know how to be at the center of God's will? You must be obedient. And the reason obedience can produce such awesome peace. You want to know how? Because it takes the pressure off of me. It takes the pressure off of you. It takes the pressure off of us. What pressure? We ain't got to figure it out. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Another way of saying that, don't try to figure it out. You ain't got to. There's no pressure now to try to figure the situation out. It takes the pressure off of us as his children from trying to engineer some type of solution or engineer some type of outcome. The only thing I have to do if I want peace is to do what God tells me to do. And then I can simply leave everything else in his I don't know about you, but that produces a lot of peace in my life, in my mind. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to figure a way out. All I've got to do is give it to God and rely on Him that He is not only going to take care of the situation, but He's going to provide me a way of escape from even being tempted to worry. And that's just not advice from me. That's biblical advice. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, No temptation has taken you, but such it is common to man. But God is faithful that he will not tempt you above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You say, Rob, I want that peace, but I know what I'm going to be tempted to do. I'm going to be tempted to worry. I'm going to be tempted to do it my way. Oh, Rob, so often I come up with this way and it seems so easy and it seems like it would take me to peace. And in the end, it doesn't. And I know that temptation is going to come again. Well, guess what? Jesus tells us how to deal with temptation. He does more than tell us. He shows us. Matthew chapter 4 tells us that Jesus was tempted at least three times by the devil in the wilderness. And you want to know what Jesus did all three times? He used the word of God. And you want to know what happened all three times? Satan got mad and left. Satan has no defense against the word of God coming, coming from the mouth of someone who is compassionate Prayerful and obedient to what God wants. Satan has no armor. You want to submit to God and have the devil flee from you? Then when it comes to the temptation of worry and giving in to your own solutions for your chaotic situation, turn to the word of God. That's what Jesus did. So in this situation, where do you turn? I'll tell you where to turn. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for some things. Is that what it says? Be anxious for almost nothing? No. Be anxious. Don't worry about anything. And then it not only tells you what not to do, it tells you what to do. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, make your request be made known unto God. And then it tells you what will happen. After you've brought it to the throne, after you've left it there, after you've given it to God... Then you walk away obediently and guess what's going to happen? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. What will it guard it from? Worry, anxiety, depression, temptation. How does it do that? Well, it tells you. We'll guard your hearts and minds, listen, in Christ Jesus. Again, we go back to it's all about Him. There's no pressure on us. The only pressure is to say yes to what they say to do. Say yes to God and obey And peace will come. Now, I have to lay something pretty important on you right now. Some of you this morning have said, I can see your mouth, amen. Some of you have been shaking your head, some more a little than others, and that's awesome, right? But i got to tell you something because I'm concerned about you. You understand, right, that you could agree with every single thing that I have said. As we've looked at this story, as we've looked at God's word, you could be sitting out there going, that's right, that's right, you're right about compassion, you're right about prayer, you're right about obedience, and guess what? You could walk right back out that door and have no peace. You could walk right out that door and not experience the peace of God. Because it's all here and not here. It's all here and not here. Let me give you a great example. I've told this story before. I love this story. In fact, I remember hearing my pastor as a kid tell this story. But it's a perfect illustration of the point I need to get across and then we're done. It was Christmas Day. 
the world's most famous tightrope walker, whose name was George Blondin, had done a lot of awesome things. But at this time, and this was many, 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 many years ago, he was going to take it to the new level. He was going to walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls. They stretched it out. The line was out there. You had American fans on our side and Canadian fans on the other. And George got up there and he really hammed it up. And not only was he going to walk across this rope, but he was going to take a wheelbarrow with him. And not only was he going to take a wheelbarrow with him, but he was going to fill that wheelbarrow up with dirt. And that's what he did. He went across the very first time from the American side to the Canadian side and people just exploded, right, with praise and wow and all of that. He came back and the same thing happened and he did it time and time again, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. In fact, as the story goes, he did it more than 20 times. The people sat there each time, though, so super anxious because they knew what would happen, right? One slip, one one balance problem, and he was gone, going to fall into the falls. But it wasn't until his last trip that it became the most memorable. He came back from the Canadian side, came across, came up off the rope, and came onto the platform. And as he did it, he was standing right in front of one of the most just expressive and exuberant fans. A person who had been screaming and, 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 and rooting for him and all of that. And the guy just stood there and kept going, I believe in you, George. George, you're awesome. George, I believe you could do this all day long. George, I believe you could do anything. George, you're so awesome at this. George, this is great. George, come on, do it. You could do it a hundred times. I believe in you, George. And George got a big smile on his face. And he's looking at that man. And all of a sudden, he dumps that big load of dirt right there on the platform. And he puts it up, and he puts that wheelbarrow back on the tightrope, and he looks at that man, and he gives a big smile, and he says, thank you so much for believing in me. Now get in the wheelbarrow. Get in the wheelbarrow. Now we all smile because all of a sudden, mm, ah, mm. and you want to know what I think that illustrates? The fact that Jesus Christ is here this morning. His word has been preached. God has let you know how you can experience true peace. Yes, you got to have compassion. Yes, you got to be in prayer. Yes, I've got to be obedient. Lord, I believe you. Get in the wheelbarrow, Jesus is saying. He's saying, you know that load of dirt that you've been carrying around and worry? Dump it in my wheelbarrow because I've got it. What are you going to do?